Hi everyone and welcome back to the Learn Neuroradiology YouTube channel. Today we're going to do our sixth and final video of the spine tumor series. We're going to talk about three cystic lesions you might see in the spine. Then we're going to go through a quick summary of all that we've seen about spine tumors. As always, I'm your host Brent Weinberg, the creator and editor of LearnNeuroradiology.com. If you haven't seen the other videos, be sure to check those out and go check out the website at LearnNeuroradiology.com. Today we're going to talk about cystic lesions that occur within the spine. These are usually non-enhancing and well-defined lesions. They're almost always intradural and extramedullary, so they're inside the dura but outside the spinal cord. The main ones that you're thinking about are arachnoid cysts, dermoid cysts, and neuroenteric cysts. The additional test that you can think about doing if you want to see a little bit more about it is think about doing a contrast-enhanced myelogram that can give you more information about whether these lesions fill with contrast. This is cyst case number one. What we have here is some images from an MRI of the thoracic spine. What you see is a post contrast with fat saturation. You see a little bit of deflection of the thoracic spinal cord here. It's confirmed on your sagittal T2 here. You see the normal contour of the cord is just deflected anteriorly. And uh, you have something that looks perhaps a little bit rounded if you take a look at the axial images, you see a rounded lesion in that location. You see, again, the spinal cord deflected anteriorly. So the thing you have to think about is what kind of additional study you might want to do next and what might help better evaluate this lesion. So for that, as I mentioned before, you want to think about a contrast-enhanced myelogram. So in that, you inject some contrast through a lumbar puncture in the lumbar spine. You uh, have the position of the patient so the contrast mixes in the fecal sac. And here you see the CT images from a post-contrast myelogram. You see here, you see the fecal sac filling with contrast. You see similar to the MRI, you see the spinal cord in the middle here, and you see the contour of the spinal cord is deflected anteriorly. And if we look where that abnormality is, you can now start to see the margins of a rounded, well-defined lesion inside the fecal sac and dorsal to the spinal cord. And it's partially filling with contrast, but it's not filling completely. So it's got a communication with the CSF and the fecal sac, but it's not just freely communicating. Here you see it confirmed on the axials. You just see mixing of contrast there, not quite as bright as the surrounding CSF. So this is what an arachnoid cyst looks like on a myelogram. You see uh, it's, it's again got shading of that contrast there. Arachnoid cysts tend to follow CSF on all sequences, so they'll look like it on T2, T1, and post. You, uh, they'll suppress on flare because you have normal fluid suppression, do not have diffusion restriction. You can sometimes see remodeling of the adjacent bone. So you might see scalloping of the bone. That's usually from chronic uh, pulsation of the CSF. And so from normal CSF flow, you just get a smooth erosion there. You should not really see bone destruction. On myelograms, they can fill, but they often will fill slower than the normal CSF. So it might let you better see the margins. Another tool that you can use is very thin slice T2 imaging like Fiesta or KISS. Uh, it's possible to have arachnoid cysts in the extradural space, so in the epidural space, but this is somewhat rare, but you, you can see these sometimes. I've seen them uh, once or twice. So keep that in mind if you see a, something that looks like an arachnoid cyst in the extradural space. Cyst case number two, we have an MR. We're moving down lower towards the conus here. This is a 48-year-old man who's got increasing lower extremity numbness. On a T1, you see some sort of lesion here just along the inferior aspect of the conus. Your T2 delineates it a little bit better. You've got T2 hyperintense, well-defined lesion, uh, something uh, a little bit of shading here, maybe a little bit of phase artifact at this interface here. If we do fat suppression, what you're going to see is portions of this are T2 hyperintense like fluid, but this inferior part is suppressed on fat suppressed imaging. That means this lesion contains fat. This is a, what a dermoid or a dermal inclusion cyst looks like. These uh, are essentially um, remnants of embryonal tissue. They contain multiple embryonal layers. If you have an epidermoid cyst, it can be positive on diffusion weighted imaging, but uh, dermoids contain multiple embryonal layers. They can contain fatty elements. So if you see a slightly complex cystic lesion in the spinal canal that has fatty elements, you really want to think about a dermoid. If it's very simple and well-defined and all fat, think about a lipoma. As I mentioned, dermoids are less likely to have diffusion restriction compared to epidermoids. If these rupture, much like dermoids in the brain, 
they can cause a chemical meningitis. For cis case three, we have a 52 year old woman. The uh, indication for the study said rule out cord tumor. Here we see some axial T2 images through the mid cervical spine. We see a very well defined T2 hyperintense lesion is deflecting the spinal cord, which is pushed to the left end and dorsally. On your sagittal images, you have a similar thing. You see a very T2 bright lesion anterior to the spinal cord. You see some CSF flow artifact around it a little bit, and it's even brighter than the surrounding CSF. On post contrast imaging, we see that this doesn't really enhance at all. It's kind of T1 hypo intense, even to the surrounding CSF. You see a little T1 brightness here on post contrast. It's probably a little bit of a flow artifact corresponding to that area that's T2 dark. Here we see that we've done a myelogram in this patient, so similar to that prior study. What we see is a contrast filling the fecal sac here on coronal and sagittal images. What we see is a very well-defined rounded lesion anterior to the spinal cord. This is an MR myelogram, so it's an MRI. That's T1 weighted fat saturated images where after injection of intrathecal contrast. And again, you don't see any filling of this cystic lesion on any of these images. Uh, this is a neuroenteric cyst. Neuroenteric cysts are fluid intensity lesions that occur within the uh, neural axis. They d are not filled with CSF and they shouldn't communicate with CSF. The most common locations are either anterior to the brainstem or in the ventral uh, components of the thoracic and cervical spine. Uh, they're often associated with vertebral anomalies. Here you see this is just a superimposed tractography from the same patient showing how the fibers of the spinal cord are displaced and kind of splayed apart by this extra axial lesion. So in summary, we've seen three cystic lesions which can occur in the spinal cord. We've seen arachnoid cysts which follow CSF on all sequences. They may or may not fill with contrast on myelograms, but myelograms can help delineate their margins. We've seen dermoids, which are complex embryonal lesions that have complex components, often containing fat. The most common location for these is in the conus. And we've seen neuroenteric cysts, which are usually fluid intensity. They can have some intrinsic hyperintensity on T1, and they're usually located ventral to the cord. So if you see lesions with cystic components and not a lot of enhancement, think about each of these three lesions. So in summary, we've looked at a lot of different spine tumors throughout. Uh, as we approach these, we want to consider a location-based approach. We want to first see if we can divide what compartment it's in. Then we want to think about our differential diagnosis based on that. In this table, I've put some of the most common spinal tumors by location. First, we have intramedullary, those that are within the spinal cord. The most common spinal cord tumors are primary tumors of the spinal cord. That includes ependymoma and astrocytoma. Ependymomas are more common in older patients, but astrocytoma is a little bit more common in younger patients. If you have a lesion that's inside the dura, so intradural, but outside of the spinal cord, these are also most commonly tumors. The common tumors that you think about are schwaomas or nerve sheath tumors and meningiomas. And sometimes the enhancement pattern can help you differentiate those, the location, uh, but these are the most common too. If you have extradural lesions, the differential is far broader. These are lesions outside of the thecal sac. Think about things arising from the surrounding tissues. That includes the bone, the disc, the surrounding nerves, and vessels. Uh, these are the most common things that you may see. Metastatic disease and lymphoma, particularly arising from the bone. Bone tumors, such as osteosarcoma, giant cell tumors. Infection, you can definitely get as well if you have discitis, osteomyelitis. So that's often something that you might think about in those cases. The key point though, when you're thinking about spinal tumors is that the spine is just an extension of the central nervous system. So anytime you see something, think about if this were a similar lesion in the brain, what would my differential be? That can really be helpful. Many times you're not gonna be able to give a definitive diagnosis, but if you can give a useful differential, then you can help your surgeons and help your other physicians figure out what the next steps are. One last point I have for you is if you don't know what's going on, consider imaging the brain, Sometimes you'll see a similar looking lesion in the brain, which can help guide your diagnosis. So if you have a tumor, you might image the brain. You might have a similar tumor that makes you think it's a drop metastasis, or you might see something that you thought was a tumor, but in the brain, if you have something that looks like demyelinating disease, then it's more likely that you have demyelinating disease in the spine. This can be a very useful tip.
Finally, I just want to say thanks to everyone for making it to the end of this series of spine lectures. Be sure to check out the rest of the videos on the rest of the YouTube channel at, at learnneuroradiology.com. If you have time and want to check it out, be sure to follow me on Twitter. I release a lot of information there. Uh, I have a lot of radiology memes and other uh, interesting radiology content. I'll refer you to some other uh, great radiology study materials on there as well. Thanks again for tuning in. This will be the last of the spine series. We'll move on to uh, some additional topics. Hope to have additional videos coming up this spring. So thanks to everybody for tuning in and have a great day.